Today we're going to hear from Diane Firth. Um, Wobberman? Yeah, well, I'll bet. Edmonton and currently out of Wobberman. There you go. Yeah. And Cindy Plant from Vermillion. So thank you, Cindy, for making the track to Edmonton. So Diane is an accomplished fiber artist as well as a quilter. Um, her designs are inspired by interactions with everyday living. So she gets her ideas from whatever's in front of her on a given day. A wide range of mixed media experimentation has resulted in the creation of many of her pieces, and that's certainly the case for this lovely globe here. Lots of different techniques, fiber art techniques, um, making it a mixed media piece. And Diane also creates quilts using traditional methods of piecing and hand quilting. So, Diane Firth. Okay, well, hello everyone. As Sharon said, my name is Diane Firth, and I am a member of the Fiber Art Network, and I have been for the last 14 years. Uh, before I begin my talk today, I'd like to tell you a little bit about the Fiber Art Network. We are a group of artists from uh, Western Canada, which includes BC, Alberta, Saskatchewan, Manitoba, the Yukon, the Northwest Territories, and none of it. We're quite, quite a large group and um, very creative, very creative group. As a group of, uh, of artists, we have a cooperative network of fiber arts. We support and encourage the promotion of fiber arts and quilting as a true art form. Many of our members are on the leading edge of art expression, and our members include people like authors, teachers, judges, and exhibitors. Many are award winners and have uh, exhibited and won awards not only in Canada, but internationally. Our goals include the promoting of our artists with a broader appreciation of all fiber art forms, including art quilts. We celebrate our achievements and we mount group exhibits. FAN was formed in 1997 and has mounted group exhibits starting as far back as the year 2000. We produce new fiber exhibits yearly, such as this one, The Threads of Hope, and currently we have many available to travel. And to see previous exhibits, you can visit our website at www.fiberartnetwork.com. On that site, you can also view works of our other members that are independent of the exhibits. Other benefits of being a member include yearly retreats. Everyone is kept informed by a monthly member's newsletter that's both informative and entertaining. And there are many regional meetings with some in person as well as using the platform Zoom, which I think a lot of us are getting used to nowadays. There are, they help facilitate many members hosting informative meetings on our website, uh, such as record keeping and promoting ourselves more effectively through our fan web, fan web page. So this is a very supportive group of talented people, and they all have an appreciation for creating art that we all have in common. If you'd like to join our group, you can talk to any one of us today, or you can just go to our website if you're interested. Uh, we'll be happy to help you on your art journey. So this is the Threads of Hope exhibition, as you know, coming in today. In, in an exhibition exploring our hope, longing, and desire for the future of the world. This exhibit is available for booking from May 2020 through to May 2023. And it asked us, do you long for a peaceful, harmonious society and a healthy earth? Do you desire reconciliation, forgiveness, unity, healing and balance? Do you hope for positive solutions to any of today's issues? In this exhibit, fan artists express world issues that are meaningful to them, the art pieces flow from one to the other with a thread of hope connecting them, thus completing a line of artists joining forces to improve our world. And that's the red ribbon that you see running through all of our artwork today. There are 58 pieces in this show, and they're done by 50 of our members. They represent many styles and techniques and issues. All are unique and interesting in their presentation. Okay, so my presentation today is entitled Paint, Felt, Quilt, and Stitch. We all need to start with an idea as artists. And with the introduction of a new theme for an exhibit, I try to write down my first thoughts as a starting point. 
Very often these can go by the wayside, but I use it as a launching point to kind of daydream, daydream and envision the art I want to make. From daydreaming to a rough sketch, as quite often I'll pick up a scrap of paper to jot down the ideas. From there, I'll find a sketchbook with plenty of room in it to continue on with the ideas, because many don't make it, but the plan does start to develop at this stage. I enjoy the mixing of several medias and applications, but my favorite <laughs> that I return to so often is a marriage of felt and quilting together. Now to work on how to create that vision. What will I need? The gathering begins. For Threads of Hope, I wanted to portray the world and the hope for in the future of a healthy ecosystem for our survival. I wanted to create this with felt and use the other media as the supporting artists or um, players in this, in my artwork. After settling on my drawing, I would work on creating a background. I chose to use 100% cotton for the quilted background. The vision was for a cultured garden with many flowers for the bees to pollinate. I used a sea sponge loaded with fabric paint on gently wet fabric to make the background. Loading the color this way would help to wash out the definition of the edges and bring in the light through the image. I worked from larger to smaller to create a bit of depth in it as well. I could bring the image into focus later on by using my stitch. When I'm painting fabric, I'll quite often do a few extra pieces that I can use later in another work. You never know when you might need a piece of sky material or other interesting painted fabric. While creating the water, I used many different colors of sun dye paints. A technique I like to use is with bath salts scattered on the wet paint in the sun. This is helpful to add the movement I was looking for. As the paint dries, the salts create a drawn shadow over the surface. This is useful for interest in the sea along with the dark and light values that I chose. I find it most enjoyable to get out the fabric paints on a lovely summer day and just sit and create. The felt portion, that required more research to add realism to my globe of the world. I selected my choices of colored wool and layered and tapped with a felting needle according to my picture and with careful consideration for where I was placing what. I knew it'd still take on a life of its own when I did the felting process because there's so much shrinkage with wool. A strong factor to consider is always the movement of the wool as it shrinks down in the felting process. Details can be needle felted after it's dry, but changing the base at this stage is very difficult. In the dry stage, I did add the finer details that I wanted. Now I have a felted world. My background supporting theme and how do I tell the story? I would need a mock-up of my work before starting. And quite often I use paper and cloth to layer and addition. And before any of the actual stitching or cutting goes, I have to be sure of what I want it to look like. I add notes to my sketchbook next to the drawing, and I find this helpful to try different ideas when going back to work on the project. I'm not always in my studio when I have the thought of what or how to add something, but there's usually a scrap of paper nearby me. I have a lot of scraps of paper laying around. <laughs> While trying out techniques, Often I will construct something to realize it's not going to work, but that's okay because I always learn something from it. I don't think of it as a waste of time because the experience may always be useful in another project that you're working on. What will the support cast be? How will I attach the items? What will they say? How will the quilting work together with the story? Well, the bee was very important, so I chose to create it with stitched thread. I researched and I printed out the images I wanted to make in different sizes so that I could hold them up and addition them to the one that I wanted. And I had about four different sizes ranging from about six inches all the way down, but I found that this one fit the best on, onto the piece. Organza was the base for the wings, but I needed something heavier for the body, so I used a different stabilizer. Color choice, once again, was very important in my thread selection. And I worked on the bee stitching on my sewing machine for over three hours until I was satisfied. And for a while it actually looked like a fly. <laughs> but I kept at it. The bee would be attached separately later on, as would all the other embellishments. 
The hardest part, part that I found was how to display and bring it all together. Um, where would the red ribbon of hope enter and exit? How could it bring the eye to a focal point and lead you back out again? How would I divide the seed from the micro view of the garden? I had my sketch, but now is this gonna work? A few simple changes happened at that point, but the more I layered the painted and dyed materials, the more it took on its own direction. A tilt of the globe was important, and so was the texture of the flat portion for interest, so I thought maybe prairie points. Time to layer and quilt now. I always enjoy this process, as I find it's in my comfort zone. I can create anything I want as I meander and draw with my threads. While stitching, it's important to bring in focus what you want the viewer to see. So this was the time to stitch in my flowers. By outlining them, I, all of the ones that I wanted the viewer to see. And it's not necessary to draw them all, because our imaginations will help fill in the smaller gaps in our artwork. Background filling is important too, to keep things consistent and not leave large negative spaces. So it is a good time to add general items as well. Variegated thread offers a lot of variety for added interest. I will use solid colors for highlighting and more definition while I quilt or thread paint also. This is so important in bringing the art together, so it's almost like giving it its life. Now marry it all together. I attached the prairie points to lift the globe up and hand stitched at this stage. Many items were attached this way to create the dressing as I call it. I hand tied what represented the abandoned nets out of twine to the scale I wanted. I had to capture the effect of what it might be catching in our oceans. I had several embellishments gathered in my basket to use, but many of them didn't make the cut. And honestly, I had a basket about this deep and this big. <laughs> but you don't know what you're gonna use until you actually go to make your artwork. Too many can overwhelm a good piece and lose what we're trying to say, so sometimes it's best to leave them in their basket. A few beads can add a bit of interest without taking away from the focus. And in this piece, I have a few very tiny beads just to add a little glint at the top. And you barely see them, but the glint is there. So I truly hope for our world to maintain a healthy ecosystem. And I think this is very possible, and it's needed now, and it's needed for all our future generations. The initial title for this talk was going to be Rediscovering My First Love. Now, we all have one. And I bet an image is coming to your mind right? Your first love. What I'm referring to is not what you might think though, so let me explain. As a child, I was always drawing. As a teenager, drawing and sewing. But by grade 12, had not really settled on what to do next. A teacher coaxed me to go to university and take something, anything. So I enrolled in a basic arts program at the U of S in Saskatoon. One of those classes was a studio painting course, which nearly scarred me for life as far as making art goes. Certainly it colored my opinion of art and artists, but that's a story for another time. I'll answer it later if you're curious. Then a boyfriend, no, not my first love, suggested interior design might be the ticket. So I transferred programs and schools and moved to Winnipeg, Manitoba. I love the artistic aesthetic bits, the problem solving, the um, design aspects, but wasn't so fond of the technical and mechanical parts. I mean, have you looked at a set of working drawings lately? Or tried to make sense of the building code? There's the National Building Code, the Alberta Building Code, other provincial building codes. My hat goes off to designers, architects, and engineers who deal with this stuff. So I briefly considered transferring to fine arts, but no, they were much too weird in the fine art department. And anyway, there was that time in my first painting class, right? So I stuck it out and earned a Bachelor of Interior Design. Now, I want to tell you of an amazing experience in my first year at U of M, which set my course for a future teaching career. We had been assigned the task of choosing a natural object and visually describing this object eight different ways, each one on a separate five inch by eight inch card. I chose a piece of scrap wood I found somewhere on campus and proceeded to show it 
with line, texture, color, and so on. This was the very first of the major assignments, design assignments. So when the word came that they were graded, my fellow design students and I rushed to the architecture building to see how we did. Of course, you want to see, right? What a sight when we entered the interior design studio. The professors had stapled each and every five by eight inch card to the studio walls, complete with grades for all to see. Couldn't get away with that today. With 110 students in my class, that meant 880 pieces of artwork were visible all at once, all on one wall. They had stapled them side by side, right across the whole studio wall. Can you picture it? Right then and there, I said to myself, I have to get into this business of teaching so I can have a steady diet of seeing so much creativity. Skipping over time and all the details of how it happened, I ended up teaching at a college interior design program for more than 30 years. It had never occurred to me to go into education, but I discovered I loved teaching. Well, most of it. I loved inventing design assignments just to see what sort of creativity the students would come up with. And usually they did not disappoint. In some cases, their solutions and execution truly astounded me. Another bonus was access to the PD fund. That stands for professional development. This allowed me to take yearly excursions for conferences and classes, mostly to the States. I could justify anything with the words design or color in the title, and I sure did. Now, at one point during all this time, one of my friends went back to school to study fine arts. This got me thinking of getting a master's in visual art. However, family circumstances, a husband, two small boys, living away from the city, etc., all precluded that plan. Logistically, it just wouldn't work, and so it was not to be. So before I knew it, retirement was upon me. The college had adopted a program called D2L, which stood for Desire to Learn. This program called for instructors to post all assignments, lecture notes, readings, etc. on a platform allowing students 24-7 access. For me, a true analog, D2L stood for destined to leave. <laughs> so I retired on a good note and embraced my newly found playtime. Now I could really indulge my love of textile art. I took a petite painting class, began dyeing fabric, stepped it up by creating more art quilts, and ventured into entering my work into the National Jury Show with some success. Then, Providence had me meet two lovely individuals from an organization called FAN, which Diane so well introduced, and they encouraged me to join. I didn't know what to expect. Would this accomplished group of fiber artists be standoffish and aloof? Or would they be more like what I have experienced of quilters everywhere, having a friendly and inclusive attitude? I attended my first fan conference in High River in 2018 and received a very warm welcome. This group has been so inspiring, just like you said. Then, one relaxed retirement morning, I watched a YouTube video of a young 20-something woman who was sharing a portfolio of work she had done while studying textile design. It both delighted and depressed me. You've heard that saying, if I knew then what I know now? I wailed to my husband, I have missed my chance. That should have been me studying textile design. For a long, despairing moment, I felt life had passed me by and I had missed my true calling working daily with art and textiles. Well, he set me straight immediately. But you're doing that now, aren't you? He was right, as he often is. So I began asking myself whether I could actually be an artist. And if so, what sort of art do I want to create? What is my style? Do I even have a style? In fact, do I have anything at all to say? More on that in a bit. 
When I embraced this um, Threads of Hope piece, I learned a lot about myself. So this is the piece that I did. It is becoming evident that trees are somewhat of a personal metaphor. Their cycles of growth, putting down of roots, having periods of dormancy, all seem to reflect the inevitable ups and downs of life. I have written um, a quote in here from Proverbs 13, 17, and it reads, Hope deferred makes the heart sick, but longing fulfilled is a tree of life. I used a scarf in the background that I found at a thrift store in BC when I was at the latest uh, fan conference. And I, re um, I reversed the background so you can see this is kind of light, whereas the reverse of it down here is dark. And that gave me kind of two for one. Um, the leaves are made with my dyed fabric. The tree trunks are um, commercial fabric, if you can believe that. And of course, there's the ribbon. Um, the bottom roots are done with um, cork, a very lightweight, stitchable through cork. And I had a tricky business on it, on putting this red ribbon on here because I didn't want to piece it in. I wanted to applique on top, but I'm not really an applicator. So I hand stitched it underneath as best I could, but then I really stitched it down with hand stitching, which is starting to show up quite a bit in my work. Um, so back to the question, am I an artist? I consider God to be the ultimate artist. Don't we see beauty in nature every single day? Isn't his magnificent artwork just a sunrise or sunset away? I came across a quote from Scottish Olympic racer Eric Little, whose story was told in the movie Chariots of Fire. He said, God made me fast, and when I run, I feel his pleasure. So this is what I've discovered lately. My first love has always been art making, and expressing myself creatively is fulfilling that longing. So I'm so thankful for the privilege of exploring such a fascinating world. Mostly I'm just playing around today and I love it. In fact, I've adapted that quote for myself. God made me artistic and when I create art, I feel his pleasure. I still am not quite comfortable with calling myself an artist. Artist and training will do. So thank you very much. Uh, yes, thank you very much both of you for sharing your journeys and your process and producing your art, and yes, I believe you're artists. Um, uh, in terms of Van coming up with these uh, ideas for shows, how did they come up with them, and, and how much notice do you get ahead of time? Uh, well, quite often, what we do is we throw ideas when we meet at our yearly retreats, and uh, or if somebody has an idea themselves and they want to mount one, I think, is that how botanical reflections happened? I think, I can't remember if that was one idea that was thrown out at our retreat or somebody said, hey, I have an idea for a wonderful exhibit and, you know, I spoke to them at the Van Dusen Gardens in uh, Vancouver. It's in Vancouver, right? It's in Vancouver. Right. And so anyways, they said, if we are willing to, you know, mount it, so at that point, what we do is we'll put the call out to our members and we'll say, okay, we're looking for 40 pieces or whatever. And we'll give you a, a timeline, say we'll give you three months or six months or whatever that timeline is to respond for an intent to enter. So now this is just an intent Say, oh yes, I am interested in that one. I think, I think I'd like to do a piece for that exhibit. So we fill out online and once they get to their limit, um, I believe there's a waiting list because with intent, some people drop off because they haven't actually made the, the artwork. So then after that point, um, the actual intent to enter deadline is put there and we have to have our work done and submit it in with the photograph at that point. So they now have a solid, uh, you know, concrete type thing that they can take them and say, yes, this is, and you know, we work with the galleries and set up the <coughs> timelines and people in our group will be responsible, like we have different volunteers all the time that will be responsible for doing an exhibit. Like Sharon did today, she brought this one to the Craft Council here. And so... Um, the Ukrainian Arts Council. Right, sorry Sharon, thank you. The Ukrainian Arts Council. And um, so we have volunteers that do that, but the actual 
exhibit itself might be started by, uh, say, Cindy and I, or whoever, you know, wants to do this. So now we would be, become responsible for getting that onto our web page, the intent. Uh, correct me if I'm wrong, Sharon. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, it, there's a process that has right. evolved over the years. Yeah. We, we started um, right from the very beginning. The idea was that we were going to exhibit, and FAN was started in 1999. And the first exhibition was in 2001, I believe. It was in the um, art gallery at the South Okanagan, which is now the Penticton Art Gallery. And uh, so it was always uh, an objective of FAN to have exhibitions. Yeah. But it, when, when we started um, a partnership with the Canadian Quilting, Quilters Association in about I don't know, 2005 or six, somewhere in there. Um, we found sponsors an award that's part of the National Dirt Show within the uh, Canadian Cultures Association. And the reciprocal, the benefit for a fan, is that we get invited to participate in the um, um, CQA conference with uh, an exhibition, because they always have an exhibition called the National Jury Show, which is a competition, but then they have concurrent exhibitions. So FAN is invited to submit a concurrent exhibition. So the themes were built around whatever the theme was for that Quilt Canada conference. And, and so we started, you know, looking ahead every two years to what are the themes and what are we going to, um, use as a focus or a theme for our own exhibition. And then there were so many people interested to get involved that we started mounting exhibitions in the in-between years, because Quilt Canada's every two years. And now, some years, we have two exhibitions started. So it, it, it depends on the energy within the group to, to organize an exhibition mm -hmm. and also the opportunities that are available to us. <laughs> it's about the concept of playing. Yeah. Um, because you you said that you've had lots of time to play. I heard recently from a, a quilt instructor that it's really not about playing, it's about practicing. So my question for you, having watched you work for, you know, extended periods of time and the, the copious amounts of product you can turn out. How do you decide what you're going to do next? So you've got something, but then does that launch you into something else? Is there a question that you ask yourself? No, um, I almost never start with an idea in my mind. I almost always start intuitively just looking through my stuff and sometimes I will um, just start putting fabrics together. Uh, I started, I really enjoy improv piecing, I'm starting to do that. But for example, with, with the theme on this, Threads of Hope, um, I didn't initially have this idea in my mind. Um, and I guess in some ways, I don't know really where and how it works. I do, I stand by the fact that I play around a lot. And if something, if I'm putting something together and it's not working, I put it away. I just don't look at it for a long time. I just, I don't have any trouble with that. Um, and on, on some of this, like the sketches I've done in, in here in Threads of Hope, You'll see in my book, um, there were lots of different ideas that I had, but in the end, trees are showing up. They just start showing up a lot, and so I made a tree. But um, I work intuitively, that's all I can say. I just kind of, I don't want another business. I don't want another career where I have to be worried about meeting somebody else's standard. I got enough of that at my job. Oh, I mean, I love my job, but but I don't have to answer to anybody. I don't have to make, I don't have to 
please anybody. I don't have to, you know. And so joy of retirement. I'm playing around, and it's it's wonderful. It's wonderful to not have to, um, you know. I just. I don't know. I just love well, it. Do I? I just, you know, and, and and I've discovered too that if I don't do some of this stuff, if I'm not painting or I'm not printing papers, if I'm not cutting up fabric, I get kind of cranky. So I, you know, it's in there. It's got to come up.